Hold up. Before we get into this next episode, I want to tell you about our virtual conference that's coming up on February 15th and February 22nd. We did it two Thursdays in a row this year because we wanted to make sure that the maximum amount of people could come for each day since the lineup is just looking absolutely incredible. As you know, we do. Let me name a few of the guests that we've got coming because whew, it is worth talking about. We've got Jason Louie. We've got Shreya Shankar. We've got Dhruv, who is product applied AI at Uber. We've got Cameron Wolf, who's got an incredible podcast and he's director of AI at Rebuy Engine. We've got Lauren Lockridge, who is working at Google, also doing some product stuff. Oh, why is there so many product people here? Funny you should ask that because we've got a whole AI product owners track along with an engineering track. And then as we like to, we've got some hands-on workshops too. Let me just tell you some of these other names just for a moment, you know, because we've got them coming and it is really cool. I haven't named any of the keynotes yet either, by the way. Go and check them out on your own. If you want, just go to home.mlops.community and you'll see. But we've got Tunji, who's the lead researcher on the Deep Speed project at Microsoft. We've got Holden, who is the open source engineer at Netflix. We've got Kai, who's leading the AI platform at Uber. You may have heard of it. It's called Michelangelo. Oh my gosh. We've got Fazan, who's product manager at LinkedIn. Jerry Louie, who created Good old Llama Index. Oh, he's coming. We've got Matt Sharp, friend of the pod. Shreya Rajpal, the creator and CEO of Guardrails. Oh my gosh, the list goes on. There's 70 plus people that will be with us at this conference. So I hope to see you there. And now let's get into this podcast. Hey everyone, my name is Aparna. Um, I'm one of the co-founders of Arise AI. Um, and I recently stopped drinking coffee, so I take, I, I've started on matcha lattes instead. Hello, and welcome back to the MLOps Community Podcast. As always, I am your host, Dimitri Os, and we're coming at you with another fire episode. This one was with my good and old friend Aparna, and she has been doing some really cool stuff in the evaluation space, most specifically the LLM evaluation space, we talked all about how they are looking at evaluating the whole LLM systems. And of course, she comes from the observability space. And for those that don't know, she's co-founder of Arise and Arise is doing lots of great stuff in the observability space. They've been doing it since the traditional MLOps days. And now they've got this open source package, Phoenix, that is for the new LLM days. And you can just tell that she has been diving in head first. She's chief product officer and she has really been thinking deeply about how to create a product that will help people along their journey when it comes to using LLMs and really making sure that your LLM is useful and not outputting just absolute garbage. So we talked at length about evaluating rags, not only the rag, the part that is the output, but also the retrieval piece. She also mentioned, and she was very bullish on something that a lot of you have probably heard about, which is LLMs as a judge. So I really appreciated her take on how you can use LLMs to evaluate your systems and evaluate the output. But then at the very end, we got into her hot takes. And so definitely stick around for that because she thinks very much on the same lines as I do. I don't want to give it away, but she came up with some really good stuff when it comes to fine tuning and traditional ML and how traditional ML engineers might jump to fine tuning. But that is all. No spoilers here. We're going to get right into the conversation and I'll let you hear it straight from Aparna. Before we do though, Huge shout out to the Arise team for being a sponsor of the MLOps community since 2020. They've been huge supporters and I've got to thank them for it. Aparna was one of the first people we had on a virtual meetup back when everything was closed in the COVID era. 
And she came into the community Slack, was super useful in those early days when we were all trying to figure out how to even think about observability when it relates to ML. And so I've got to say, huge thanks, huge shout out to the Arise team. Check out all the links below if you want to see any of the stuff that we talked about concerning all of the LLM observability or just ML observability tools. And before we get into the conversation, would love it if you share this piece with just one person so that we can keep the good old ML ops vibes rolling. All right, let's get into it. Okay, so you wanted the story about how I ended up in Germany. Here it is. Here's the TLDR version. I was living in Spain, so I moved to Spain in 2010, and I moved there because I met a girl in India, and she was in Bilbao, Spain, doing her master's. She wasn't from in, she wasn't from India or Spain. She was from Portugal, but I was like, oh, I want to be closer to her, and I also want to like live in Spain because I enjoyed it. I had lived in Spain. I spoke a little bit of Spanish, un poquito, and then... I was like, all right, cool. Let's go over to Bilbao. Uh, I've heard good things about the city and the food and the people. So I moved there. As soon as I got there, this girl was like, I want nothing to do with you. And so I was sitting there like heartbroken on the coastline of the Basque country. And it took me probably like a month to realize, well, there's, there's much worse places I could be stuck. And so I enjoyed it and I had the time of my life that year in Bilbao. And then I met my wife at the end of that year at this big music festival. And uh, so we were living in Spain. We ended up getting married like five years later, had our first daughter like eight years later. And then we were living there until 2020 when COVID hit. And when COVID hit, the lockdown was really hard. And we were in this small apartment in Bilbao and we were like, let's get out of here. Let's go to the countryside. And we had been coming to the German countryside because there's like this meditation retreat center that we go to quite a bit. And so we thought, you know what, let's go there. Let's see like if there's any places available and we can hang out on the countryside, not see anybody. The lockdowns weren't as strict. I mean, there were lockdowns and stuff, but when you're on the countryside, nobody's really enforcing it. So we did that and we ended up in the middle of nowhere, Germany with, you know, 100 cows and maybe like 50 people in the village that we're in. So that's the short story of it. Wow. wow, wow. Well, that's an interesting intro. (laughs) There you go. I mean, we were just talking and I will mention this to the listeners because we were talking about how you moved from California to New York and you are freezing right now because it is currently winter there. And Germany isn't known for its incredible weather but it's definitely not like new york that is for sure yeah it's uh east coast winter out here so (laughs) i wanted to jump in to the evaluation space because i know you've been knee deep in that for like the last year you've been working with all kinds of people and maybe you can just set the scene for us because you're currently for those who do not know you i probably said it in the intro already but i will say it again you're the head product or chief product officer, I think, is the official title at Arise. And you have been working in the observability space for ages before you started Arise. Uh, you were at Uber and working on good old Michelangelo with that crew that is uh, got very famous from the paper. And then you've been talking a ton to people about how they're doing observability in the quote unquote, traditional ML space. But then when LLMs came out, you also started talking to people about, okay, well, how do we do observability? What's important with observability in the LLM space? And so I'd love to hear you set the scene for us. What does it look like these days? I know it's hard out there when it comes to evaluating LLMs. Give us the breakdown. Yeah, no, let, let's jump in. So I, so first off, we're seeing a ton of people trying to deploy LLM applications. Like the last year, Demetrius has just been, it's been super exciting. People are, and I'm not just saying, you know, the the fast moving startups. I'm saying there's like, you know, older companies, companies that you're like, wow, they're deploying LLMs that have like a 
you know, skunks work team who are out there trying to deploy these LLM applications into production. And um, in the last year, what I think we've seen is that the there's a big difference between a Twitter demo and a real LLM application that's deployed. Um, Preach. And yeah, <laughs> and the fact that it, what we're seeing is that you know, unlike traditional ML, where people have deployed these applications, and there's a lot of people who have that kind of experience. With LLMs, it's still relatively a small group or few people who, are de who have deployed successfully these applications. And, well, you know, the hardest parts about this still ends up being evaluating the outcomes. You know, in the new era, in traditional ML, you had, um, you, you know, one of the things that still matters is you want your application to do well. In traditional ML, you had these common metrics, right? You had classification metrics, you had regression metrics, you had your ranking metrics. In the new LLM era, you can't just put, you know, these metrics, you know, you know, what I'm saying is like, we saw in the beginning, some people were doing things like Rouge and Blue Score. Oh, it's a translation task. Oh, it's a summarization task. But there's a lot more that we could do to evaluate if it's working. And the biggest one that we're seeing kind of take off is, you've probably been hearing it, is LLM as a judge. And so... It's a little meta. It's uh, yeah. where you're asking an LLM to evaluate the outcome of an LLM. And it, I mean, we're finding that across deployments, across what people are actually putting in production, it's one of the team, it's one of the things that teams actually really want to get working. Huh. Um, and I don't know, it's not that crazy as you start to think about it. Humans evaluate each other all the time. We interview each other, we grade each other, so, you know, teachers grade students' papers and it's it's a very, you know, you know, it's not that far of a jump to think AI evaluating AI, um, but that's that's kind of this novel, um, new thing in the LLM space. So you don't have to wait for the ground truth necessarily. You can actually just generate an eval to figure out was this a good outcome or not. And the thing that my mind immediately jumps to are yeah. all of these cases where you have people that have deployed LLMs or chatbots on their website a little bit too soon and you see the horror stories because people go and they jailbreak it and it's like, oh man, that is not good what this chatbot is saying on your website. All of a sudden, <laughs> I saw one screenshot where people were saying, you know, I can't remember what the website was, but People were talking about how, oh, I don't even need OpenAI. I can just use the chatbot on this website. It's obviously uh, <laughs> ChatGPT, you know, or GPT-4. Like, you can ask it anything, and it will give you any kind of response. And you can play with it just like you would play with a, a OpenAI LLM or a GPT-4. Like... Is this, you know, asking questions about the product and saying, but the product isn't that good, is it? And then leading it into the chatbot then saying, yes, this product is actually horrible. You shouldn't buy it. And it's like, oh. you can't say that on your own website about your product. This is really bad. So does, like, do the LLMs as a judge stop that from happening? I, I think is the really interesting piece. No, I, I mean, it's absolutely a component of it. So you're absolutely right. People don't want, and, you know, the common applications we're seeing right now is like, I think you hit one of them, which is like chatbot on your docs or chatbot on your product. So give me some kind of like a replacement for um, like the customer support bots we had. Um, and then there's kind of some more, you know, interesting ones, which I've been calling like a chat to purchase type of application where um, a lot of these companies that are doing uh, like used to do recommendation models or et cetera, or are, uh, you know, maybe selling you trips or selling you um, some kind of products, now have a, a chatbot where you can go in and actually explicitly ask, hey, I'm doing X, Y, Z, I'm looking for this, and then it recommends a set of products. And sometimes these applications use both ML and LLMs together in that chatbot, like the LLM is doing the chat component, it's doing the structured extraction, but then the actual recommendation it might call out to an internal recommendation model. So it's not one or the other, but sometimes you have both of them working together in a single application. 
And you're absolutely right. They don't want stuff like it saying stuff it shouldn't say. Uh, yeah. Giving, we had one interesting case where someone's like, I don't want to say we support something in this policy because then we're liable to it if someone asks oh. a question. Um, and so there's all sorts of, especially if you're putting it external facing, there's all sorts of more rigor that it goes through to make sure it's it's working. And what LLM as a judge can do is, well, we see people checking for us things like, well, did it hallucinate in the answer? You know, mm -hmm. is it making up something, like, is it making up something that wasn't in the policy? Is it toxic in its response? Is it negative about, you know, like in the one where it's kind of shit talking its own product, is it is it negative in, in its own response? Is it um, correctness, factuality? So all of these are things that you could actually generate a prompt to, you know, generate, an, you know, basically an eval template to go in and say, well, here's what the user asked. Here's what all the relevant information we pulled was. And then here's the final response that the LLM came back with. Does the response actually answer the question that the user asked? And two, does it actually, is that answer based on something factual, aka the stuff that it was pulled on, the retrieval component? Yeah. And you can go in and score that. And, you know, what we end up seeing a lot is if the response isn't actually based on the retrieval, then it's 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 hallucinating. And they actually don't want to show those types of responses back to the user. Um, and so this is this is just a very specific, you know, I'd say the hallucination eval, the correctness eval, summarization, uh, all of these are very common kind of LLM task evals that we're seeing out in, yep. in kind of the wild right now. I should mention, it's very, very different than what um, the model evals are, which is a whole nother yeah. category of evals you might be seeing. Like if you go on, like Hugging Face, for instance, has a whole open source LLM leaderboard. I'm sure you've all seen it. It's like changes every couple of hours. Um, and they have all these metrics, right? Like MMLU and hella swag, which is all different ways of measuring um, how good the LLM is across a wide variety of tasks. But for the average kind of, you know, AI engineer who's building an application on top of an LLM, they kind of pick their LLM and then they're not really looking at how well does the model do across all sorts of generalizable, multimodal kind of tasks. They care about specifically, I'm evaluating how good is this LLM and the prompt template and the or, you know the structure that I built doing on this one specific task that I'm asking it to do. And so it's a very, does that make sense? Like that delineation between the the model evals versus the task evals here? Yeah, a hundred percent. And you did say something else, like how does, I guess what my mind goes to here is how you are able to restrict the output from getting to the end user is it that if that llm as a judge gives a certain confidence score then anything lower than whatever a five of confidence that this is the right answer it doesn't go out to the end user and it has to regenerate it or what does that look like like that last mile piece yeah i think it depends back on the application owner so we there are some people who will generate that eval and then decide not to show that response because the eval was um, was pretty poor. Um, but there's some folks where, you know, if it's a lower risk type of application, then they still show it, but then they can come back and, you know, use the ones where it did poorly on to come back and figure out how to improve the application. So I think there's a, um, there's kind of like a, you know, a trade-off that the application owner has to make between do you want to block kind of, you know, you got to wait for the LM to evaluate it and then you, like, you're going to for sure impact speed of the application experience. And so what actually we see a lot of people doing is these evals, um, you don't just have to do them in production. So similar to how, you know, in the traditional ML world, you'd have a, you know, a performance, like an offline performance as you're building the model. And then you're kind of monitoring an online performance. Well, here, similarly, as you're building an eval, 
you're kind of, we're seeing folks kind of evaluate the LLM offline, see how, you know, build some confidence essentially around, yeah. um, you know, how, how well is the application doing before they actually you know, go on to, to pushing it out to an online monitoring. So there's, there's a lot of these similar kind of paradigms that, that still apply in, in this space. Yeah, I would imagine you try and do a little red teaming. You try and make it uh -huh. hallucinate, see how much you can break it before you put it out there and and set it live. If you're doing it the right way, yeah. not just rushing it out the door, ideally. The other piece on yeah. this that I think is is important is a little bit more upstream because you were talking about how the LLM as a judge, it's evaluating if the answer that the other LLM gave with respect to the context that it was giving or that it was given was actually the right answer or evaluating that answer based on the context. But then one step above that is actually getting the right context, I would imagine. And so making sure that are we getting the context that is relevant to the question that was asked? And I know that's a whole nother can of worms. And if you've been seeing a bunch of that and maybe do you also use LLM as a judge there? Oh, yeah. Um, OK, so this is this is a great actually segue to talk about some research we've been we've been dropping lately. Um, nice. So, yes, LLM as a judge can totally be used to also evaluate the performance of retrieval. So for folks who are, who are listening to this, um, what is, you know, what is retrieval? How do you measure the performance of it? Well, basically, um, you know, in retrieval, you're retrieving some sort of context. So if someone asked a question about some kind of, let's say, product, you're retrieving relevant information about, let's just say a chat on your docs type of application. It's very common. Um, someone's asking your you know, product support documentation or your customer support documentation questions. And what happens is it retrieves relevant information from your you know, document corpus, and then it pulls you know, just relevant chunks and then uses those relevant chunks in the context window to actually answer the question. The most important thing there is that it's in this type of retrieval, by the way, is super important because it helps LLMs connect to private data. Remember, LLMs were not trained on every single company's individual private documents. And so if you actually wanted to answer questions on your own private data, then um, using retrieval is kind of one of the best ways to do that. Yeah. Um, and so here, what really ends up being important is that did it retrieve the right document to answer the question? And that ends up being a, a whole, you know, there's a whole set of metrics that we can use to actually evaluate that retrieval. Um, and recently, actually, we've been running a ton of tests measuring different LLM providers um, so we evaluated GPT-4, we did Anthropic, um, we charted some results on Gemini, we did Mistral, and we actually yeah. showed, um, you know, I, if you guys have been following, Greg Cameron actually dropped the first of these like needle in a haystack type of yeah. tests. You've been following like that? like that lost in the middle. Yeah. Yeah. yeah totally. And, you know, for, for those of you who haven't seen it, it's basically um, an awesome way to think about it, which is, you know, it essentially checks, you know, on one axis you have how long is the context. So the context can be you know, 1K tokens all the way to, you know, for some of the smaller models, it's like 32K. I think for some of the bigger ones, um, we tested uh, pretty pretty significantly. Let me, let me double check exactly what. Like 120K, I would imagine. I think that it feels like anthropics goes all the way up to that or maybe it's even more these days it's like 240 they just said fuck it we'll double it yeah so some of them we checked yeah like definitely close to yeah 120k and what what we did was basically so that's that's on one axis which is basically just the context length and then on the other axis is basically where in the context you put <laughs> the information so, you know, because some there, there's all these theories out there of like, if you put it early on, does it forget? If you put it later down, does it not use it? And so kind of placement of the context within that context window to see, you know, can you actually 
find the needle in the haystack. And the question we did for this was, um, so a little context was, the question we asked the LLM was, um, what's the, so we did kind of like a key value pair. The key was the city and then the value is a number. So we said something like, what's Rome's special magic number? And so, uh, and then inside the context, we put something like Rome's special magic number is uh, like some seven digit number. Uh, like Not 42. One, two, three. Yeah, like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And so that was Rome's special magic number. And then later we asked, we put that somewhere. So we tested kind of all of the dimensions of putting it at the very beginning of the document for a very short context window, putting it at the very end for a very long context window and all the combinations in between. And then we asked it, what was Rome's special magic number? And so it would have to go through, look at the entire context window and then answer the question. And sometimes it couldn't find it and it said, in, you know, unanswerable or um, et cetera. And sometimes it, you know, it answered the question. And what we did was we just ranked a lot of these LLM providers out there on how good was it at retrieval. And um, GPT-4 was by and large, yeah, definitely the best out there. Yeah. Um, I think of the small model providers, we were definitely impressed with Mistral, um, yeah. like the 32K content. It was, it was pretty impressive. Um, but there were some where, you know, I think we realized some of them were very, very, um, if you change the prompt a little bit, then the results totally varied. So you got totally different varied responses based on just like adding a sentence or adding two sentences. And so as a user, you know, as you're, as we're coming back and we're evaluating this, you know, if you're using some of those LLMs where you have to be really careful about how you prompt it, um, those prompt iterations can have a big difference in the actual outcome of, of that retrieval. So, um, you know, I'll share the links with Demetrios. Maybe you can link it with the, the podcast interview, but um, of course. definitely, I, I think going back to your original question of like, can you evaluate retrieval? Absolutely. Um, I think it's, it's, uh, it's really important to make sure that if you want it to answer well and not hallucinate on your private data, it's got to do well at that retrieval part. Yeah. So it's almost like you're evaluating in these two different locations, right? You're evaluating yep. the retrieval when it comes out. And if that is relevant to the question, and then you're evaluating the output of the LLM yep. once it's been given that context. And if that output is relevant to the question also. Yeah, exactly. 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 And if that output's based on the context that was retrieved. So yeah. first there's that. Yeah. So yeah. Extra, <laughs> yeah, totally. So first is like, is the retrieval that was retrieved even relevant to the question asked? Then was the output based on the retrieved text? And then, yeah, was the output itself answering, um, you know, correctness, I guess, is, is looking at, is it correct based on the information that was retrieved? So it's, um, it, there's levels to this. <laughs> so I'm a little bit like, I just had a stroke of inspiration right now. And I'm going to let you have it because I love talking with you and I love the way that you create products. But the next product that you create in this space, I think I found the perfect name for it. And <laughs> What is it? <laughs> golden Retriever. <laughs> you can do so many things with that. And it is so perfect. It's golden, of course, you know, like it's the golden metrics it's the golden retriever and so you've got your if you do if you create a product around that i'll just uh you know we'll talk later about the <laughs> the way that we can figure out this patent and the golden retriever i love that but i mean jokes aside i know that you have been creating products in this space i saw phoenix and i would love to know a little bit more about phoenix and also as i mentioned before we hit record one of my favorite things with all of the products that you've been putting out from the get-go, I think when we talked in like 2020, one of the first things that I noticed with the Arise product was how well put together the UI and the UX was for 
observing what was happening under the hood. And it feels like Phoenix took that ethos and went a little bit further. You being a product person, can you like break down how you think about that and how you were able to get inside of what metrics are useful and how can we present the metrics that are useful in a way that people can really grab onto it? Yeah, well, first of all, thanks, Mitras. That That's really kind. Um, yeah, I, I'm super excited about Phoenix. I think um, we got to give a big shout out to to the Phoenix team within, within our eyes, actually. Um, so Phoenix is actually, um, for those of you who don't know, it's our OSS product. Um, it's got a ton of support for LLM evaluations and LLM observability. So if any of you guys are looking to just Try something, not have to send your data outside, have it be lightweight. It's, um, you know, it's open source. So do do, do what you want w- with it. Um, I think the intention behind Phoenix really was, so there's a couple different components in Phoenix that I think folks who are trying to get observability on LLMs will like. This is Skylar. I lead machine learning at Health Rhythms. If you want to stay on top of everything happening in MLOps, subscribe to this podcast now. Now, 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 now. First is, if you are, one of the things we just noticed very early on was that these applications, many of them have not just one call they're making. There's many calls under the hood. Like even in a simple chat bot with retrieval, there's, First, the user's question, then you have the, you generate an embedding, then there's the retriever, then there's the actual synthesis of the context, and then there's a response generation. So there's five or six different steps that have happened in something that feels like one interaction between the product and the user. Um, and so the first thing was, well, if you have all these sub steps, some, if something goes wrong, something goes wrong within those, you know, five or six different steps that's happened then being able to pinpoint exactly what are the calls that are happening under the hood and how do I get visibility is important. And so with Phoenix, um, one of the most popular components of it is you can see your full, you know, you can full see the full traces and spans of your application. So kind of, kind of like the full stack trace is how you can think about it. So um, you'll see the breakdown of each calls and then which calls took longer, which calls used the most tokens. And then you can also evaluate at each step in the calls. So kind of like we were just talking about where at the end of the application, at the very end, um, when it generated a response, you can have a score of how well was the response. But then if the response, let's say it was hallucinated or was incorrect, then there's a step above you can go in and look at the individual span level evals and look at, well, how well did it retrieve? And then within the retriever, you know, how let's evaluate each document that it retrieved and see if it was relevant or not. So there's kind of a lot of thought put into first, how do I break down the entire application stack and then see, you know, evaluate and evaluate each step of that outcome. And then the other part that's been, I'd say, really a lot of thought in is Phoenix does come with an evals library. Um, it's task evals first or, you know, you know, LLM application nice. emails. So it's it's definitely useful for folks who are actually building the application. Um, and then we've just seen a bunch of people kind of build these evals in production. So it comes with kind of a lot of these best practices baked in. One of them that um, actually just, just went viral on Twitter last week, we dropped a, a big research thread on this, which is um, should you use score evals or classification evals. Um, I don't know if you caught caught that one, but um, I saw your post blew up. I definitely did, but I didn't. I don't know what the difference is between the two, which yeah. might make me look like yeah. no, 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 no. This uh, this like me just space is changing so fast or early. Like there's, I think we're all just trying to learn and soak up as much as we can. Um, but so score evals versus cl- um, classification evals. Score evals is basically. You can think about it as the output's a, a numeric value. So let's just say we were uh, asking LLM to evaluate how frustrated is this response and, you know, rank it between 1 to 10. 
One being someone's really not frustrated. Ten being someone is super frustrated. Um, well, what would you expect? You would expect that, okay, if it said one, it's super frustrated. If it's ten, it's not frustrated. But then kind of somewhere, if it said something like a five, it's kind of like, okay, it's, maybe it's passive aggressive. It sounds super frustrated. Yeah. But it's like, you know, like you, you kind of expect it to like kind of the numbers in the middle to make sense. Um, yeah. And what we just realized as we did this research was that the score value actually had no clear connection to the actual, you know, you know, frustration that this person, like if it gave a number that basically wasn't one or 10, then that score value really had no, no real connection. Like another example, which was actually the one that we posted was we, we gave it a paragraph and we said, um, you know, rank how many spelling, how many words have a spelling error in this document between one to 10. If every word had a spelling error, give it a 10. If no words have a spelling error, give it a zero. And then if it's kind of somewhere in the middle, like 20% of the words have a spelling error, you know, give it a two. If it's 80%, give it an eight, you know? Yeah. Um, and what we saw was that in many cases, it would give a spelling you know, score of like 10, but so in some cases, only 80%, you know, only 11% of the words had a spelling error. Like, But it still said eight, all of the 10. words were off. Yeah. So it was like, yeah. this might as well so be like, in Dutch. Yeah. So like that value that it came back with meant nothing to it. Mm -hmm. um, and so, and, and the reason this is important is like, what we're seeing is like, there's a lot of these LLM eval cookbooks that are out there where people are recommending, you know, basically set it up as a score. And uh -huh. what we've actually been seeing is don't do that. Just do it as a class. Just do binary stuff, you know, or, or you can do multi-class, you know, but like tell it explicitly like frustrated, not frustrated. Because if you try to assign a score, that score just doesn't, it doesn't actually um, have any meaning to, to the corruption level. So basically it's saying, hey, it's it has to be very clear. It's frustrated, not frustrated or a little frustrated and you have to make it it's not a sliding scale there's no llms do not understand spectrums it's like uh you know from all of the tests we've done it is it is not going to give you a meaningful value on a spectrum and, and then so, if you're base yeah if you're basing stuff downstream off of that score you're screwed exactly and so and this has been something that like has been a lot of people I, I think it's kind of like, as we've been putting it out, people have been like, oh, I've seen that. Like I'm, you know, like I was using score and then I was like, these values meant nothing to me. So then I switched to classification. And so um, there's a whole set of research around this, probably still to be deep dived into here. But um, yeah, this is, you know, this is the kind of stuff that's in the Phoenix evals library is just best practices based off of what we're seeing, what we're putting in production, what we're helping folks actually launch. And so you get kind of these best, you know, best in class, I'd, I'd say templates that are pre-tested around things like how to test for hallucination, how to test for toxicity, how to test for correctness. And then you can kind of go and we have people who would then go off and make their own custom evals, but it's a great place to kind of have a framework that runs both in a notebook and also in a pipeline uh, very efficiently and is meant for 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 kind of, um, you know, so you can swap in and out of offline and online very easily. Yeah, because the other piece that I was thinking about, all these, these evals that you give it, then it feels like you're not going to get very far if you're not doing custom evals. Have you seen that also? Totally. I think there's a lot of folks who are building, you know, maybe they start with something, but then they end up kind of building their own what makes sense for their application, adding on to it. So I, I definitely think at the end of the day, the nuance here is it's probably different than the ML space is that that customization of that eval ends up being really important to measuring what's what's important to your app. Um, so I, I don't know, that, that's one of the things I predict is we're going to see a lot a lot more of this. And do you feel, because one thing that I've seen is like how when you put out 
these different evaluation test sets, the next model is just trained on top of them. And so then they're obsolete. And so it's, it's going to be this game of cat and mouse in a way, because the <laughs> models are going to be able to eat up the test sets as soon as they get put out for anyone to see, or is it going to be, all right, I've got my evaluation test set and I just keep it in house. I'm not going to let anybody else see that so that I don't taint the model. Yeah. I, it's actually something I wonder about a lot too, um, is as these new LLMs come out, it, are they really blind to the test sets that they're actually then evaluating them on? I think um, like the Gemini paper I thought did a really good job of calling out. They actually built their own data set that was blind and then tested on that data set. And um, they called that out explicitly, which I thought was really important because, you know, as, as people are sharing the results of like the next best LLM, et cetera, yeah. I think we're all wondering like, did you just, you know, like, you know, did did I have access to that training data set? So I, I, I wonder that all the time too. <laughs> well, it's pretty clear these days that uh, as I did not coin this term, but I like it and I will say it uh, a lot, benchmarks are bullshit. And so all these benchmarks on hugging face or on Twitter that you'll see like, oh, this is SOTA. This just came out. It blew everything else out of the water by whatever, 10 times or you make up a number there. I don't even consider that to be valuable anymore. It's it's really like what you were saying where these things, I know you actually went and you did a rigorous study on it, but it's so funny because we are, the rest of us are just going off of vibes and we're seeing, <laughs> oh yeah, this is not really working. This is not doing what it, I thought it was going to do. And so if I use a different model, does it? And then you try that and you go, oh yeah, okay, cool. This is better. This is easier to prompt or this prompt is much easier to control, whatever it may be. And so I appreciate that you did a whole rigorous study on it. I also, I'm conscientious of time. I want to make sure that I highlight that you all are doing like paper studies, right? And you're meeting Bergen, every once yeah. in a while. I think that's awesome. I know that you've got a ton of smart people around. And so I, I can imagine you're getting all kinds of cool ideas from gathering and doing these paper studies. I would encourage others to go and hang out and uh, do those. We'll put a link to the next one in the show notes so that in case anyone wants to join you and be able to ping ideas off of you, that's great. I still would love to hear how did you come up with the visu visualizations? That's the coolest <laughs> pieces, I think. You didn't get into that part, and I want to get get to it before we go. Oh, I, I mean, I just got to say the um, the the team team's amazing. So the and, and I think the you know trying to find a way to bubble up, you know, at least in the LLM space, one of the cool things you, you know maybe you've seen some of the demos of it, but like especially with the retrieval. There's a lot in the embedding space that's you know, helpful to visualize. So how far away is the prompt that you have from the context that was retrieved? And if you're missing any context and it's super far away or it's, you know, it's, it's like reaching to find anything that's relevant to, you know, those are all really cool visualizations that you could actually surface and kind of, kind of help people see a little bit of, okay, here's my data. Here's what it thinks things are connected to. Um, okay. So, yeah, again, you know, check out Phoenix. Love, love all the notes on, on the UI. Yeah, actually, it, it reminds me that I think one of the first people I heard the word embeddings from was you on, like, that first meetup that you came on back in, like, June 2020 uh, around then because you were already thinking about them. I think you were thinking about them from recommender systems and that angle and then has it how has that totally. changed now no great great question um well i think i think embeddings are just so powerful <laughs> and yeah. I'm, I'm so glad that we're you know we're all talking about them and using them in observability because there's it, it's it's super powerful even in the llm space i think in the past there's you know, folks use them, like you mentioned, recommendation systems, image models, but the LM space, I mean, the core basis of retrieval is based off of those you know, word, you know, the, the embeddings. Um, 
itself and doing that vector similarity search to fetch the nearest embeddings. Um, so I think the the use case is really, really strong in in RAG um, for LLMs. The, you know, and, and, and so because it's such a core component, it, it's also something that is important to now and just like when we were going back, if the retrieval's off, then the response is just not going to be good. And so you need a really good way to verify that what was retrieved was relevant. And if there's any shift in, again, going back to all of this is now textual, if the prompts are changing, what your users are asking are different, or the response of the LLMs are different. These are all things that you can you can actually measure using embeddings and embedding drift and uh, things like that. So um, I, I think there's just, maybe more use cases now than ever to, to dig yeah. into embeddings. Yeah, it has to be treated as a first-class citizen, 100% exactly. these days. Exactly. That's a really good point. And I do, I saw a recent paper, speaking of papers, uh, from uh, Shreya Shankar. Did you see yep. that Splad uh, or spl Spade, I think is what it is, uh, talking about the prompt deltas and evaluating via the prompt delta, like you have your prompt templates but then you're evaluating the prompt deltas and it's like, wow, there's so much creativity in this space and the ability to look at how can we evaluate things differently than we are right now and see if we can get a better outcome. Yeah, I I, I think I still need to dig in to, to Spade specifically, but That's um, is, yeah. the, um, I, I mean, I, I think the... The amount that the space is moving is just so fast right now. It's so exciting. <laughs> and yeah, um, it is very cool. The the one thing, maybe I'll just, you know, there's maybe two things I just wanted to like at least drop like my quick hot takes or, or notes on. Yeah, oh, then um, let's do it. This is great. This is what we're going <laughs> to chop and put at the beginning of the episode. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Right. So I think there's, you know, I always hear this from, I don't know, I, I just see it in the in in discussions, but I see a lot of people talking about um, fine tuning, like really early on, like their application's not even deployed, and they're like, "Oh, well, our use cases eventually we're going to go back and fine tune." And um, I, you know, I get asked from folks like, "Hey, partner, does that make sense?" Is like a step in troubleshooting an LLM application. Um, and I think one of the reasons I get that question a lot is. If you just think back to, you know, a lot of the AI teams are now, you know, they've worked on traditional ML and they're shifting now to LLMs, but that's something we're all very used to and very familiar with. We're used to training models on data and then deploying those models. And fine tuning is feels very familiar, right? You grab data points that it doesn't work on, you fine tune it, and that's how you improve the performance of your model. Um, but in this space, fine tuning feels like you're jumping to like level 100 when sometimes a lot of this could be, you know, like I was telling you in the RAG case, change the prompt a bit and you get vastly different responses. And so it's like almost the thing that we're like geared towards to do, which is like, oh, it makes sense. We're going to, training's now fine tuning and we're all used to that paradigm. But I, I think in this space, let's start with like the lowest hanging fruit and see how that improves. Um, Cause I, I, I think, you, you know, and, and Dredge Karpathy actually drew this like really awesome image of like, you know, level of effort versus the ROI, you know, kind of, kind of of that effort and prompt engineering, right? Like there's so many things you could do to improve the LLM's performance before you jump into fine tuning or like training your own LLM. So it's just, I think it's important to like start with, with something that could have the highest ROI. You are preaching to the choir and I laugh because I was like talking about how fine tuning to me feels like when all else fails, you'll throw some fine tuning at it. And it's like, yeah, that's what you need to, you need to look at it as like the escape hatch almost, not as step two. It should be what you go to when you can't get anything else to work. And try rigorously to get everything else to work because it is exactly like you said it is so much easier to just 
tweak the prompt than yep. fine tune it. And and I didn't connect the dots on how similar the two are. And like, oh, if we're coming from the traditional ML space, then it's easier yep. to jump there and be like, oh, well, that's just because we need to fine tune it. And then it'll do what we want it to do. Yeah, totally. Um, I I think there's just something very natural feeling about, okay, you know, training's now fine tuning, but it's, you know, I think it's one of those changes we all have to just just adapt with with the the space change. Yeah, assimilate. Yeah, one hundred percent. Excellent. Um, and then my my other hot take, I guess. Um, yes, I let's hear it's it. Totally a, a hot take, but um, I think sometimes I hear um, a lot of this. You know, I, I maybe I hear it less now than than I was in the beginning. Um, so I. I hear a lot of like, well, it's kind of a continuation of the fine tuning. Well, if I pick an open source model, I can go in and fine tune it more and I can, you know, or I can then go and, you know, modify it for my use case because I I know I, I have access to the model weights and, and can do that. Um, I think that I hear a lot of folks asking, well, does choosing an open source model versus a private model end up? slowing down product development or like what what's kind of what's kind of the pros and the cons of, of one versus the other um i think i was hearing a lot more of like you know almost resistance for some of you know just the private models in the beginning and a lot more of the you know open source i am so in this course i gotta say i'm you know all for the open source community like i think i'm i'm also all for you know, whatever LLM just makes your application the most successful it can be. Um, so pick pick the one that like gets you the performance and the outcomes that you need. I don't think that like, um, you know, some people make a bet on the open source because they're like, oh, later I can go back and fine tune or it's better and et cetera. But it's, again, are how many of those folks are really going to actually fine tune. And for what I've been seeing, out out in the wild, starting with the OpenAI or GPT four has just been helping most people get to kind of the outcome that they need their application to get to. Yeah. Um, and so, again, I think I just come back to like, there's, you know, all for the open source community, all for our, you know, just getting your application to actually work as as good as it needs to to work. Sure. But start with start with like, what do you need for the application, and less of like. I think the um, how's this gonna scale? Yeah, like I it's like I that think... conversation back in the day where you're like, oh, we're gonna need to use Kubernetes for this, and you're like, wait a minute, <laughs> we have no users. Are you yeah. sure Kubernetes? You're I know you're planning for the future, and this is great for the tech debt, but uh, we might want to just get some up on Streamlit before <laughs> we do anything. Totally, 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 and I think that that's like what I keep coming back to is like. The more of these, you know, similar in the ML space, we want to get more of these deployed actually in the real world, get the application to add value to the organization, show the ROI. And I think that um, that's really important to to the success of these LLMs and companies. Actually, and the other piece to this that I find fascinating was something that Laszlo said probably like two years ago. And Laszlo is an uh, infamous person in the community for those who do not yes. know in the community Slack. And he was talking about how you need to get something in production as fast as possible because then you'll find where all of the bottlenecks are. You'll find where everything is messing up. And unless you get into production, you don't necessarily know that. So each day or each minute that you're not in production, you're not finding all of these problems. And if you can use a model to make your life easier and get you into production faster, then you're going to start seeing, oh, well, maybe it's the prompts or, oh, maybe it's, uh, you know, whatever the case may be where you're falling behind and you're making mistakes or the system isn't designed properly. Yeah, absolutely. So I think uh, maybe as we wrap up the podcast, that that's really is get stuff out as fast as you can. You know, evaluate the outcomes. I think that's, you know, LLM evals is something that I think is 
pretty pretty got a lot of momentum around it in in the in folks who are deploying and in the community. So evaluations is important, and then um, I think knowing how to set up the right evals, knowing how to you know benchmark your own evals, um, customize it, um, what types of eval score versus classification. There's just so much nuance in that whole eval space, and so. As we continue to drop more research or share more stuff we're learning, um, we'll, we'll share it with the community. Excellent. Parna, it's been absolutely fascinating having you on. As always, I really appreciate it and look forward to having you back. Awesome. Thanks, Mitras. Thanks, and thanks, MLOps community. Hey, everyone. My name is Aparna, founder of Arise. And the best way to stay up to date with MLOps is by subscribing to this podcast.